Hello, 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 welcome! Welcome to the stream. So today we're going to be continuing on with a little bit more of the new Order mod. Today we're going to be playing as the Empire of Japan. Uh, the reason we're playing as Japan is that I did a poll a few days ago. Uh, it got second in the poll. The first one, I think, was the someone in the former USSR, which we're going to do at some point, but I think we're going to do that as like a primarily a YouTube series, but today we're going to be trying out uh, Japan. Because last time we did finish off our America campaign. So we're back in the good old year of 1962. The Empire of Japan, the Jewel of the East, the Land of the Rising Sun, Dai Nihon Taikoku. The Empire of Japan goes by many names, but none are disputing its status as a hegemon of East Asia. Following a grueling victory in the Second World War, a victory paid for in blood and iron, the Empire of Japan stands triumphant in Asia. From the frigid waters of Sakhalin, to the bustling metropolis of New uh, Tokyo, to the far reaches of Calcutta and New Guinea. On the surface, Japan is everything it could ever have wanted in 1962. The Zaibatsu champion, Asia's economic growth at breakneck speed. The Imperial Japanese Navy is the most powerful maritime force in the world. From Tokyo Bay to San Francisco, the Imperial Japanese Army is the enforcer of Tokyo's will throughout most of Asia. Most prominently, it guards Japan's crown jewel and once immutable enemy, China. Now brought to heel. Let me just scroll down a little bit. The politician in Tokyo bitter, but the Taisai Yakuza Nakai has stood strong over the 20 years, heralding a Sintasai, a new order over both Japan itself and Asia, led by the conservative Hirohai Ino. However, deep beneath this, the seemingly perfect victory lies the bubbling cauldron of threats to the Empire's homogeny. In China and Southeast Asia, winds of dissent are brewing. The Imperial Japanese army is overstretched. There's only so much ground one force can cover thoroughly. Across the Pacific, the United States seems poised to avenge their, defeated, uh, their defeat nearly 20 years ago. Deep inside Japan itself, the labyrinthine structure of the state hides a deep rot of corruption and deceit. One that is slowly working its way to the surface and could potentially threaten the very foundations of the Japanese Empire. Uh, features. Core Japanese political destiny through unique parliamentary and ministry mechanics. Maintaining their hegemony across the co-prosperity sphere through di both diplomacy and war. And engage in the grueling narrative of deception, deceit, and corruption. You ever decide to play Komi? Uh, the epic can go in every ideology other than... Okay. So, we currently... I mean, we gotta get our research slots going here. As Japan, I, I feel like we're probably gonna get into a little bit more active warfare than we were able to get to in the United States campaign. The new, when we played the United States, I think we got into, what, like, three wars, maybe? We'll go with, um, actually, what, are, what even are you? You are infantry fighting vehicles. We actually probably do want to get some of you guys going. Is there anything from 1960 that isn't research that we do want to get right away? Not really, as far as I can tell. You're basically what we want. Industry, I mean, it's 1962, so it's, like, still three years ahead of time. So for the most part, I think we're kind of good at all the basic stuff. You can get better recon companies. But I don't know if that's necessary. You know what? Let's go for... Actually, we don't have any anti-tanks, I, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm imagining. I don't really know what Japan's actually up to right now. So let's just go for some doctrine techs. Let's go for... Uh, air supremacy? Or air superiority? Let's go for air superiority on you. Then we're going to go for... A blue water navy, and then follow that up with some strategic planning, speed match planning, breakthrough. You know what? Let's go for maneuver warfare doctrine. We'll get these kind of basic things going. When are you doing Red World Fan Fork? We already did a campaign in Red World. Um, a few weeks ago, I think, at this point. Um, how many troops do I actually have right now? I have 42 divisions. I'm, I guess I'll put you guys in Korea for right now. Where else do I have troops? Probably have some units. I need to this army. So I need to purple. Because I'm assuming I also probably have some troops in... Do I have troops in California? I don't. So you know what? Let's have you here. Put you into San Francisco. Sign you both to armies. We need to cut you in half. Sign some generals. And then we should be pretty good to go. Also assign a field marshal to you. If you're going to go to Korea, you might as well just hang out. I guess near Shanghai for right now. 
Have you done Red Flood before? I have played a handful of campaigns in Red Flood uh, in the past. Up to speed 5. National Focus. Um, stability goes up. So, you know, let's do financial analysis. Having actual political power is such a relief compared to where we were before. And our factories right now, 301488. So, we want to actually build a bunch of military factories just kind of in um, Japan. So, we got 80%. Yeah, let's build them kind of like right here for right now. So, how are we looking on logistics? We're basically good on everything. So, we can build up... I guess you're just kind of basic infantry. Build like two of you guys going. Triangular square. I don't know what that really means. We'll just get some of these square guys, I guess. And our planes kind of are fine where they are. And let's actually get all of our planes together. Fly all of them to Tokyo Airport. So the Eno Nixon negotiation. The scenes in a nondescript office in the Kantai. It is four in the morning and everyone is asleep except for Prime Minister Hiro Eno and a Japanese provisional ambassador to the United States, Tazan Ishibashi. The two men have been in the office for 72 hours as present following the emergency radar contacts detected off Hawaii three days ago. Families all across Japan and the United States are glued to their seats. Those who are not... Those who aren't already in their nuclear bunkers and hideouts. It was deemed so until the telephone rang. It can only mean one thing. The first ring echoes. Then the second. In the silence, the heartbeats of both men are clearly audible. The third, following the protocol. Inabashi followed the protocol. The fourth. Inabashi picks up the phone. Hello, Ambassador. It's President Richard Nixon on the line. We need to talk. At present, two carrier groups are staring each other down 40 kilometers east of Oahu. Uh, one wrong move. One provoked reaction. It's the end of the world. Deep beneath the waves of nuclear submarines, a pinnacle of nuclear technology, able to end the entirety of Osaka or San Francisco in a single salvo. It's darkly humorous to how the fate of the world hangs in the balance through the actions of two men. One of which is on the verge of collapsing after a three-day run of unceasing work. In it, in his stilted and weary English, Tazan Ishibashi said the words that could change the course of history forever. President Nixon, the Dai Nihon Taiko is willing to negotiate his position for the sake of our future and yours. I think Hirohito's still around. Showa Empire. Open the Japanese government over. Okay, so there's actually a lot of stuff. So right now, the House of Representatives. So we got the Liberals, the Kedites, the Independence Conservatives, and the Reformists. So right now, it looks like the Conservatives are in charge. In the House of Peers. Get high support. People are kind of okay with us. Interactions? What do, what do you do? Discredit faction, discredit faction, embellish your Oh, so there's like a lot of stuff we can do here in the future. And how actually powerful is our navy? We currently have 442 ships, which I would say is pretty impressive, all things considered. We'll probably reorganize a bunch of stuff in the future. A nasty quarrel. Colonel Anishi threw his bottle to the ground and lazily raised his fist. He had beer stains down his uniform. His medals were oiled in a particular pointed alcoholic brew. In a slurred speech, the colonel insulted a salary man outside a dirty late-night bar with all the energy he could muster before hurling himself at him. The salary man was thrown to the ground, hitting his head against the red brick wall, and wailed a cry of pain. He scurried to the ground to gather his balance until he was kicked by the colonel in the back, squirming more in agony. Onishi struck the salary man over and over again, pummeling him with a drunken fury in the darkness of the night. The salary man's scream echoed over the buds of dim street lights throughout the darkened streets, only quieted by the occasional blow to the face or jab at his stomach. He wailed for help, but this only angered the colonel further as he was beaten and thrown about in the back alley in the darkness of night. The colonel grasped a handful of salaryman's hair and dragged him from the alley to the middle of the street, stumbling to teach him a lesson. He raised his hand to slap the now sobbing and beaten man until a siren approached from further down the road. The police had arrived, and they left out of their cars to stop the fighting and arrest both of the men. The salaryman clung onto the police with sheer terror in his eyes, not in tears mixed with the blood dripping from his broken face. The colonel heckened and roared at the officers, resisting arrest and spitting at the salaryman from a distance. Both were stuffed into a police van and driven to the nearby station, tired and shaken from their scuffle just a moment ago. At event the next morning. So my navy, I'm assuming it's just everywhere. Is it like the American Navy where they're just in the middle of the ocean for no good reason? No, it seems like for the most part, these ships are actually docked. Combine all of you. Combine all these smaller fleets. 
Apparently there is a straight crossing from um, Japan to Korea, so that's good to note for the future. In case that ever becomes relevant. Oh, we have so many, so many boats. Every single Navy. All of you. I want just to come to Tokyo. And then I can re- It keeps going! Then I can arrange all of you a little bit better. But I can't select. I gotta select the smaller things, right? Can't just select the big symbol. You gotta select the smaller symbols. Yes, yeah, so you all go here. All of you... Saying there's an extra 38 ships? That's too many goddamn ships. I guess you guys go to Taiwan. There we go. Well, we'll organize the Navy a little bit like this. The Tasai Yokosagnaki. Happy New Year! There's too many events. Happy New There's three events! <laughs> Happy New Year, Hariyoto san. The first days of January 1962 after New Year's recess was over. Ayato and his colleagues now returned to the diet in a chilly midwinter month. The diet building seemed gloomy from the distance and the grounds were wet with pre uh, precipitation from the night before. Ayato's colleagues in a Tensai Yakunosaki uh, greet each other with relish, displaying great friendliness towards one another. Perhaps this year, Hiyohoto thought to himself everything would go smoothly. Are you alright? Quite so. Prime Minister Hiro Ino opened up the first session of the diet this year, proclaiming that this will be the year... That this year would be the year of continued prosperity for the Japanese people, and the pan asianist ideology had gotten one year closer to its realization. Uh, Yoko Sanakai's deputy sat divided. Ayato sat among the conservatives right next to the liberals. Behind them were the reform bureaucrats and the coyotes, backbenchers of the party. Everything was going well. Then the yearly budget. The conservative proposal proposed to maintain the military and domestic uh, allocations to the same level as the previous year. The Liberals rose up in contention, demanding a cutback towards the military. Incensed, reformed bureaucrats stated that they cannot abandon the principle of the national defense state, not at the height of the Cold War. The Geodites raised their hands. 1952. Then they bickered among one another. Another brawl on the legislature floor. Hayato sighed. Here we go again. Welcome to Japan's House of Cards. In Yono's speech, the air was heavy with tension and crackling static. Across Japanese, vast urban sprawls, Manchurian great industrial centers, all the way to the great uh, villages in southern China. Over 100 million radios and TVs cracked to life in the offices of Guangdong. Large screens and loudspeakers buzzed as the crystalline notes of Kiagoyos uh, washed over the cross prosperity sphere. Convoys announced in a dozen languages simultaneously that a speech from His Excellency of the Prime Minister of Japan would replace regular programming for the day. Those fortunate enough to have a screen in front of them watched as the last note of the Imperial Anthem faded and the red and white logo of the Corpus Prosperity Sphere was replaced by the Prime Minister's office. Hiro Ino, arguably one of the most powerful men in the whole world, sat behind a large and uncluttered desk in his, in his ordered and suitably... Maliquent? Magno... Maliquent? Office. The Prime Minister had the most uncharacteristic expression of a release. Mouth curved into a small, dignified smile. Over a billion people held their breath as he began speaking into a measured tone befitting his office. People of Japan, honored allies... Citizens and subjects of our great Asian family come with to you bearing news of our great victory. Not the one that we are all used to, one of marching soldiers and rolling tanks, but no less great, a victory of peace. The Prime Minister pauses for a second. As of yesterday, the official agreement exists binding the cross prosperity sphere and the Organization of Free Nations with mutual respect for their maritime boundaries and security interests. The specter of nuclear war that has hung over us all of the last few weeks is dispelled. The Prime Minister kept talking, but few listened after that. Roars of jubilation, silent thanks to myriad sounds of billion lies returning to their normal rhythm after weeks of panic and uncertainty drowned out the Prime Minister's eloquent. For a brief moment, all of East Asia truly came together in celebration, and America with them, as President Nixon made a speech mirroring his Japanese counterpart. Of course, not all were happy. Some had wished for a war, some had pushed for a war, and some, the notion of ascending Japan negotiations of the morbid United States ranked deeply. Doubtlessly, such feelings... I found an echo on the other side of Pacific as well, but for now, peace had prevailed. The next morning. The jail cells at the police station were tired and bare. The salary man and the colonel were locked up in adjacent chambers. The cackling of typewriters, chat of policemen, the scuffling of feet and audible to the dark cells, all presumably coming from the offices above. A report printed out slowly be before uh, being shared about by the police officers, sounded like they had now comfortably familiar office environment. He was used, so used to, and now missed more than ever. Soon after, the keys jingled down the hallway and a noise bounced throughout the jail cells. 
The salary man leapt to the floor. Pain on his bruised face, not at his weak patience. But the thought of freedom so soon had calmed him. The immediately heavy footsteps of the guardman marched down the stone corridor of the jail cells in which both men were being kept in overnight. The salary man, convinced of his innocence, stood by his cell door awaiting the, his liberation. As the guard stopped and his keys jingled once more, a tingle sprung over him. The keys chewed through the lock and the metal door swung open, but it was not the salary man's. The guard saluted the colonel and apologized for his inconveniences, which the colonel turned his nose up and hurried out of the station. The guard locked the cell and walked back up the corridor. Each step was quieter and emptier to the salary man. The salary man shrunk in his cell and curled up against the icy stone walls of the prison alone. He wept, throwing his blood-soaked tie and hurling it across the dirty stained jail cell floor. Burying his head into his arms, his, wall, his wails muffled by sniffles and cries, he slipped to the hide from the rotting walls he was locked away in for what felt like an eternity. Why do I lose political power? Because the colonel got into a fight. Doesn't make any sense. There's so many... Okay. I forgot how many, like, pop-ups there were at the beginning of, um... These campaigns. The Conservative. Ikaira's routine was no different from the salary man's. For the hour that he had decided to go into the office to the evening times when he was, would go off of work, he had not lived near the diet building. No one would have guessed that he was a minister of justice. So unremarkable was he. Even less would uh, even less would know that he was practically a political heir to the Eno administration. Should the government enter rough times, it seems that the prime minister had set him up to uh, to be the fall guy. But regardless, he strived to do his best. The sun set on Tokyo, her reddening light disappearing off the Yokohama Harbor, while fog corners of ships around sounded of signal arrivals and departures. Kadai locked his offices and carried his briefcase with aplomb that only came after years of unceasing routine. Today was relentless. He talked to the judges, police chiefs, and governors from every precinct and prefecture in Japan. He admitted that it would be too much handled the serial killing of Nagoya, while at the same time trying to persuade the Japanese high court to see his way, but work was work. He looked forward to dinner with Satoyu tonight, and over, his over at his house, Japanese politics was not friendly to newcomers. One had to make friends sooner rather than later. Besides, Satoyu that seemed to be a decent man, a bit uh, sake idle to be in his spare time, but a hard worker despite it. Uh, maybe if Akira were to have his own ministry one day, he could find Satoya and, and a place to fit in. If, no, when. Cross the ocean. Across the ocean lies the greatest threat to Japan's sovereignty and mastery of the Pacific, the United States of America. Almost 17 years ago, through our superior command of the oceans, the once indefatigable foe of the Peninsula lies slain. And our mark on them, the Treaty Port San Francisco and Los Angeles are daily reminders of such. The Kempatai's branch of the West Coast, W. Kikan, has inserted their proxies once to the confines of American society and offered us interesting insight into the attitudes of Americans towards Japan. Richard Nixon's Republican Democratic Party was an ideological and practical failure. They still remain the voice of reason and moderation with American politics. Famously, uh, Republican Democrat President Dwight D. Eisenhower broached the peace on Japan by illegitimately allowing Hawaii's uh, ascension to the Union several years ago, as well as tearing up the Treaty of San Francisco. Though W. K. Khan was determined that the Republican Democratic establishment was the lesser of two evils compared to the... Uh, especially compared to their main electoral rivals. Far more dangerous was the National Progressive Party, an unholy union of socialist agitators and their southern allies, united in the purpose of restoring American hegemony over the Pacific Ocean and risking war with the Japanese Empire. While relatively marginal in the terms of electoral presidents, W. K. Khan was, has determined that the NPP could rise to eminence over the next few years, a strong cause for concern, as we would have to insert our rifle territory in Hawaii and the Eastern Pacific is secure. What place do we have in reserve? Basically, have, like a bunch of. Actually, they're mostly missiles. Do you really consider a missile to be a plane? No template right now for improved APC. What are you? Your air assault units? Like, what are we actually making right now? We're making rifles. Um, I think you're anti tank equipment. You are basic motorized equipment. Your basic artillery. Your improved APC. So which one is what we don't... Is the infantry APC, I think? We could put them somewhere to be more useful, for sure. Their navies are all coming together now. Yeah, we're, we're, we're slowly making this uh, a little bit more manageable. So the Admiral... Japan's blood court of politics was a testament to nature, a monument, the idea that the cunning and crafty will reign. To survive, you must be willing to drop all sense of ideological commitment, 
or dedication to a higher cause, lest the system chew you up and spits you out worse than when you started. It's a system that by its very nature ab abhors honor, yet in this land of schemers, puppets, and psychopaths, there remains one man who still holds onto his honor. The man is Kiki Takakai. A boy of humble beginnings, Takakai grew up with the knowledge of oppression and those who suffer under it. That guy, even though he, even in his, ex uh, even in his darker moments, never lost his sympathy for those who experience pain unduly. That guy, guy uh, entered into the Navy prepared to aid a nation that, despite everything, he still saw as great. During his time in the Navy, that guy, guy played a dangerous game, resisting the government of Hidiji Tojo, all within the bounds of social and political tolerance. He would eventually become a leading figure in the Navy during the Navy's liberalization in the 50s, with the admiral of the begrudging liberal movement of Japan's mainstream political scene. He would respectively leave the Navy to take up a mantle of the liberal faction's leader. A man of respect, and respected by all for his service, Takagai is seen as is keen to maintain his image both to the public and to himself. He is a realist capable of criticizing others while knowing the boundaries of his own abilities. His mind and body were never meant for politics as he quickly tries tires at the constant demands and obstructions of political reform, yet he bears on anyway. A martyr for the little man, a good soul in a land of no such thing. So how many troops do our allies have? Also, what do we have in decisions? I don't think I actually looked at this. Society is currently sympathetic to tradition. Conflict in Mongolia. Chaos in the North. A group of rabid anti-Japanese nationalists and former members of the MAN have formed a coalition against us, rising up against the rightful regime of Prince Tai. They accuse him of being a puppet of us and a Chinese, which is pa uh, patently false, under the traitor's former pr president, Imogen Tishabal. Mongolia has been thrown into open rebellion. Oh, so you guys are fighting. I mean, it... I mean, you're, you're not technically a puppet, but we do probably want to support you at some point. You're not actually in a faction, but I can send volunteers. And by that, I mean I can send you a single volunteer. But if I can send you, like, a tank division or something? Um, your Marines, your Elite Infantry. I mean, you probably want to send one of you guys, then, the Senshai Shidan. We'll throw you under here, under the best attack leader we have, and I'm going to send you to there. It won't generate any threats, so that's okay. The Ulaanbaatar Rebellion. Beyond the home islands and our more prized possessions in Asia, unrest has reared its head once more in the Mongolian steppes. Our ally, Prince Damchur Dondgrub, has already failed once to keep the Mongolians in line in the 1950s, and now he seems to have failed again. While we are not uh, yet being compelled to become involved in conflict, it seems likely that we will once again need to support the prince as Japanese citizens flee while his friendly territory only weeks ago. I'll have to keep a close eye on this. I can I can keep a close eye on it. Don't you worry. I'm already sending a tank division over, so hopefully that'll uh, work out well for us. You guys, of course, are fighting. But there really isn't too much conflict going on in the world right uh, as of yet. The bureaucrat. Some men say that money makes the world go round. Others say it's the root of all evil. To some men in the Japanese Empire, it is both the means of an end and the means of their life's work. Kaya Okinori is one such man. Kaya's political career has been one of uh, feeding the stream of income to increasingly militarize Japan. In 1936, he joined other Japanese officials in maximizing profits from Manchukuo, uh, utilizing the mineral, agriculture, and labor wealth of the region to its limit. Especially as the Empire came into conflict with the Americans in the Great, Great Asian Asian War. By this point, Kaya has been Minister of Finance and spent many years learning the tools needed to rise in the cutthroat Japanese political system. Most important was knowing what people to listen to. Since his tenure as Financial Minister, Kaya has been serving in the House of Representatives, making close friends with many of the military representatives, especially the Imperial Japanese Army veterans. The Imperial Army has been an excellent tool to enforce his authority in Manchuria, and while he's a man like Kaya, is perfect for proposing some ideas for the civilian government may find controversial. Head of the reform bureaucrat wing of the Yukonasai, Kaya Small Clique fights for centralization of power above all. Bickering among government branches has only delayed Japanese prosperity. The man does hold truth to his ideals and belief in the better, stronger Japan. It is no secret his ideals are dependent on his friends, many of whom need a respectable man in the Jap imperial diet in order to achieve their own goals. What are the case uh, with these rumors? Kaya Okonori intends to keep the military and industrial power of Japan on a tight leash no matter what.